welcome everybody. We'll just give it another 30 seconds or so as people are entering. Still a few more people coming in. All right, we'll get started now. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Charity Village webinar. Um, my name is Luigi Marshall. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at Charity Village, and I'm happy to have you here. As we are gathering here on a virtual platform, it's important to acknowledge that each of us is joining this webinar from the ancestral or unceded lands of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation people. As a settler on this land, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and traditional territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee people. For those who may be joining a Charity Village webinar for the first time, Charity Village is Canada's largest online job board for the nonprofit sector. In addition to our online job board, organizations can also post volunteer positions. So if you're looking for work or to recruit talent in the sector, Charity Village is a great place to start. We also have a ton of excellent resources for nonprofit professionals, including online courses, articles, fundraising tools, and free webinars like the one we're presenting today. Before we start today's webinar, I'd like to quickly run through a few housekeeping items. You may have noticed when you joined the webinar that you were automatically put on mute. Since we have hundreds of participants in today's session, it's important for us to minimize the amount of background noise so that everyone can clearly hear the presentation. However, you can still ask questions and make comments using the question box at the bottom of the Zoom control panel. Look for that at the bottom of your screen. And note that's the question box, not the chat box. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit your questions as you think of them, and we'll do our uh, best to get to as many as possible. You can also email your questions to webinars at charityvillage.com. If you happen to encounter any technical issues with the webinar, whether with viewing the presentation or with the audio, please let us know in the question box or by sending us an email. We'll do our best to get any technical difficulties resolved as quickly as possible. But in a worst case scenario, please remember that we are recording today's webinar and we will send you the full recording by email tomorrow. So if you get called away or disconnected, you will still be able to view the full presentation. And with that, I'd like to welcome our presenter for today, Mark Bloomberg, lawyer and partner at Bloomberg's Professional Corporation. Thank you very much, Luigi. Um, and thank you also to Mercedes for uh, pulling this all together. Um, so today I'm going to talk about top 10 compliance issues for Canadian registered charities. Uh, my name is Mark Bloomberg I'm, and I'm at a law firm in Toronto that has 10 lawyers that just focus on nonprofit and uh, charity legal issues. And uh, we have a few websites if they're of interest. Our Canadian charity law website has approximately 3,000 blog posts with uh, tens of thousands of pages of, for example, uh, CRA documents that you wouldn't even find on the CRA website. So if you're looking up an issue, you might find that uh, you can find it on our website. We have a search function and things like that. And then we have uh, what I think many people do use, which is charity data. Uh, it's basically a website that has 19 years information on every Canadian charity. You can sort and search and use it in all sorts of different ways that um, hopefully it's helpful to people. And if you want to follow us on social media or you want to get a monthly newsletter, we, we send that out with the resources that you might find helpful. So this is legal information, not legal advice. What that really means is there's a large number of people on the call from different organizations. Um, we're not specifically gearing this to anyone in particular. It may or may not be accurate in terms of your particular circumstance with your organization. Uh, the views expressed are my own, and we're happy to take questions at any point. We'll probably deal with them at the end, uh, but you can put them in the question box. So let's just talk some very basic things if we're talking about uh, regulation of charities. Um, so basically, we have registered charities are regulated by the Charities Directorate of the Canada Revenue Agency, which is a small group of about 270 people in the much bigger CRA, which is like 53,000 people. And if you've had a lot of dealings with CRA in general, uh, the Charities Directorate is quite different. Um, and uh, they focus really just on uh, charities and, and certain other qualified donees. 
Now, registered charities also fall under federal and pro federal and provincial jurisdiction. So the federal jurisdiction is the Income Tax Act and receipting and, and things related to that. Provincial jurisdiction is things like trust law, et cetera. So just keep in mind that these two things are going and uh, sometimes the laws are different and you have to look for what is the higher standard, what is more uh, demanding and, and which one are you going to follow, okay? Um, nonprofits and charities. So nonprofits that are not charities and charities, they're both tax exempt. That means if they take in a uh, surplus of money, they don't pay tax on it. However, as you obviously know, probably the Income Tax Act has this idea of a registered charity, and the registered charity can issue official donation receipts and get gifts from other registered charities. And um, the key point, I guess, I would make is that it's really good to be a registered charity in some respects. There are some benefits of it, but there's also restrictions and rules that you have to be mindful of and uh, comply with. Another important sort of initial point is just that there are so many different types of charities in Canada with 86,000 charities. CRA breaks them up, the category and subcategories, into 252 different uh, categories and subcategories. So keep in mind that often if you've had a lot of experience in the charity sector, that can be both a good thing and a bad thing because – Something that may not apply to one organization applies to another organization, et cetera. Um, the governing documents and objects of groups can be very different. The areas of charitable work and the regulation that they have to deal with as a result. I, I always say, you know, like daycares often have like a tremendous amount of regulation, even though they're quite small organizations with limited budgets and things. Um, they have far more than, than many others. Um, so the area of charitable work is important. Risk tolerance for different groups is different. It depends on the group and uh, that sort of thing. The public profile, some groups are high profile and, um, you know, more likely if there was a scandal, it would be covered by the media and things like that. Other groups, uh, not so much. Um, the extent to which there's major donors or government support or specific things that you have to comply with are different from one group to the next. Some groups are affiliated with others and therefore have to comply with a whole slew of different requirements. Uh, some are independent completely you know, by themselves, and therefore they don't have to worry about those issues. The resources of different organizations is hugely different. You have uh, maybe 20 or 30 groups that have revenue over a billion dollars a year. And then you have probably about half of charities that have revenue under a hundred thousand. So be careful when you're thinking of, oh, you know, what is the right answer for one group in terms of what they should do? And another group might not be the same, but it might just be a resource issue or a values issue or knowledge or capacity of the organization, uh, things like that. And then there's also the history of the organization and whether you've had regulatory issues in the past, you have a compliance agreement and things like that. So just trying to point out that um, um, it would be nice to think that there's everything is the same from organization to organization, but you often have, have to customize it to the needs of a particular organization. So what are the top compliance concerns? I'm going to start off with this one because the vast majority of charities that are revoked are revoked for failure to file their T3010. So this is a form and also other pieces that go into it uh, that are will need to be filed and um, you have within six months of the end of your fiscal period. So if you're December 31, you'll file it by the end of uh, June, for example. Um, and basically now you can file your T3010 online with the My Business Account system. Um, and we are encouraging people and many charities are doing it to get onto the MyBA system because there's so many things that can be done so much more easily with CRA if you're on the system and you never know when you're gonna need something done as quickly as possible. So it's good to get on the system and you can file your T3010s on there. And uh, so that's really uh, a good thing that they have. So why file the T3010? It's legally required. It's the only sort of uniform way to compare Canadian charities. If you do it right, um, it could be a good advertisement for your charity and its work. Many don't. They just sort of chuck in stuff, you know, two weeks before it has to be filed or they use the same stuff they used in the previous year. But if you're thinking about it, what used to be you could put a paragraph in to describe your current activities and another paragraph in for um, new activities. Now you can put in many paragraphs in each of them. So uh, just a suggestion to really think about what you're putting in the T3010 because it's not that a lot of people will view it, but some very important people who could make some very big decisions that could affect your charity will be looking at this or their advisors will be looking at it. Um, it's important for the transparency of a charity, and um, but it's only the beginning in terms of transparency. There are many other things that you could do uh, to be a uh, transparent charity. But needless to say, if you're not even filing your T3010, then, uh, then that's not good. Um, the consequences for failing are pretty significant, probably the most in Canada of any 
uh, of the sort of Western countries, because in many countries, um, you know, like America, you get three years to be late and then you get revoked. Here, it's like three months, six months, you're gone. So it happens a lot more than one would probably uh, want to have happen and uh, very important to, to look at it. So if you are revoked, you don't get to be a charity. So you can't then take in, for example, gifts from other charities. You can't issue receipts for donations. Um, there are other benefits you lose of being a registered charity. Um, you could have all of your property uh, taxed, basically, if it's not uh, used on, for example, uh, charitable things within that year after you're revoked. And I think many people think, oh, if that terrible thing happened, we could just re-register. But in some cases, your organization may not be able to re-register. Okay, And then the least of your concerns is a $500 penalty upon re-registration. Okay, those are some of the consequences, definitely something you want to avoid. So making sure you get it in. Um, and, you know, if you have a choice between getting it in on time and getting it in three days late, but it's much more accurate if it's three days late, then maybe it's best to get it in that year late and try to develop systems that will make sure you get it in on time and accurately the next year. Um, but you've got to make sure you're using the correct form. It's accurate, complete. It's not just the form. It's also the financial statements and other schedules that might have to be attached. And um you know, the MyBA, the good thing about using the My Business Account system is it populates the correct form for you because um, they're going to get very sticky at the end of this year in 2023. Um, CRA is going to be rejecting uh, groups that are sending in the wrong forms. Um, so they're getting, um, you know, and then, of course, that means you haven't filed your form. Um, as of the federal budget of 2012, if you give an incomplete T3010, you can be suspended. Suspended is not revoked. Suspended just means you can't issue official donation receipts or get gifts for a year. But for many charities, that would be very painful. So just pointing that out, that that's a hell of a consequence. Um, even minor typos on the T3010 can result in, for example, a CRA review because they see something or it brings it to their attention, uh, et cetera. So just pointing out that you really do want to work on this form to make sure you get it as correct as uh, possible. Some of the problems that people have are using the wrong form, not providing all the information, not providing accurate information, not providing all the schedules, not providing full financial statements. If you have audited financial statements, don't just send in five pages of a 20 page document, send in the whole thing. Uh, not providing date of birth of directors, etc. These are some of the things that uh, come up. And so here are some of the things that you need to make sure that you're getting in here. Um, and, um, yeah. And so obviously like excess corporate holdings is only for private foundations in certain cases would they need to file that. Um, but everyone has to file, for example, the directors, trustees, and like officials worksheet, um, the qualified donees worksheet, you'd only file if you made a gift to a qualified donee. So the number one reason, as I mentioned, the charities are revoked is they don't file their T3010. The number one reason probably charity gets audited is because there's a problem on the T3010. Either it is reflecting what is a problematic situation or a mistake has been made and it's problematic. Those are things that can result in you getting audited. So now I'm going to jump to probably one of the top CRA concerns, which is the ability of charities to issue official donation receipts. And in some cases, some charities are doing it incorrectly. Now, incorrectly includes everything from small issues to very, very serious, serious issues. So I don't want to have them all lumped in as if they're all the same. They're definitely not. But, you know, some of the um, problems are that the receipts lack required information or they, incl they include improper fair market value. So someone donates a car and you give them a receipt for 2000 but the car is really worth $500. That would be an example. Um, or they're issued for something where it's not a gift, um, like it was services they provided or something like that, and it's not a gift. So the thing is this, charities want to be very clear, they don't have to issue official donation receipts. And you could put up a policy just saying we don't do it. But if you want to do it, you've got to make sure it's correct. Um, we have a three-hour course we just did actually, I think last week, which goes into the details of, uh, and there are many things here when it comes to, to receipting. Um, so why would you want a receipt? I think probably all of you know that um, there's tremendous tax benefits for it. For a wealthy person putting a, a money, for example, into their own private foundation or something like that, um, where it's appreciated marketable securities, there could be like a 75, 80% tax benefit. It's very huge tax benefits. For average people, it's usually when it's cash, it's probably more like 40, 50 cents sort of benefit. But the, the long and the short of it is, so it varies somewhat, but for some people, it's a very, very significant uh, benefit. 
And if you can't, because you gave a huge amount in one year, uh, like a capital gift, if you can't use it that year, you can carry it forward for five years. Um, and you can't you can't offset 100% generally of your income unless it's we're talking like a bequest or something like that. But in general, you can offset up to 75%. So you can reduce your um, your taxes that you have to pay by up to 75% if you are making enough donations. Okay. As I mentioned, you don't have to issue receipts. If you are going to not be issuing receipts for certain things, as many charities, uh, they don't issue receipts for certain things, then just make donors aware of what policies you have on it. So the most common one is probably a minimum donation, like $10 or $50 or something. That's a very common one. But um, essentially, you want to if you want to think of it as a hierarchy, you want to have a gift acceptance policy. You want to work out what is your sort of theory on taking in fundraising, gifts, et cetera, um, and then work from that. So most groups obviously will accept cash. They'll accept uh, appreciated marketable securities, for example. But then other things, the question is, is it worth it? Um, so some groups might say for gifts in kind, unless it's over you know, $2,000, we'll accept the gift in kind if we can use it or sell it or it's useful, but we won't give you a receipt for a smaller gifts in kind. I see charities spending a lot of time on $30 gift in kind thing receipts. Not only is it a lot of time and a waste of their time, but it also creates some risk for the charity that they may be making some mistakes and things like that. Okay. Um, so, but the point is because individuals or corporations or whatever will require the official donation receipt to reduce their personal income tax, it's important that you are upfront with them about when you will and when you will not issue receipts. And the basic mantra that I suggest people use in the receiving area is if in doubt, don't receipt. Um, I know some people think, oh, you know, it's we do a thousand receipts. This is just a couple, no one's going to notice. The problem is that the people playing the game with your charity on the two receipts, they're probably playing it with 20 other charities and then CRA picks up on it and they end up auditing your charity and um, CRA only needs one reason to revoke a charity. They don't need 640 reasons to revoke a charity. So it's just from a risk point of view, doesn't make a lot of sense in many cases. Uh, so if in doubt, don't receipt. Some maybe take a more a, a completely different approach, which is unless I'm sure that it's wrong, I'll issue the receipt. So I'm saying flip it back to Unless you're sure that it's right, don't issue the receipt. There are certain mandatory elements on a receipt. And in these two slides, we sort of set out what those mandatory elements are. And then if it's a gift in kind, there's other mandatory elements. And uh, basically, um, you know, CRA has uh, four sample receipts. You can look at them. I encourage people to use these as much as possible. And we have a receipting kit that goes into um, this sort of stuff in great detail. Um, so another issue you've got to watch is legal objects. What are your legal objects? Uh, do you know what your legal objects are? They're usually in your articles or letters patent or supplementary letters patent or trustee or constitution, depending on how you're set up. So it's very important that you not act outside your legal objects. If you act outside your legal objects, then you don't have the corporate authority really to do that. And it can result in a lot of liability for the entity and its directors. So the thing to do is to occasionally look at your objects to make sure that they are appropriate for your needs at the moment and they're broad enough to cover the types of activities you want to do okay and um yeah so if you're doing things that are outside of your current objects uh my general advice is stop doing it um go to cra get permission to change your objects um, as you can uh, that sort of thing. Keep in mind that because of uh, especially certain things I'll talk about that are happening in Ontario at the moment, um, CRA is actually now backlogged. It used to be about two months to get an object review. Now it's six months in a, you know, by the end of this year, it might be longer. And by next year, it could be one and a half years to get it. So if you really want to get your objects reviewed, I'd really highly recommend you write to CRA quickly uh, to move the process along. These are examples of what looks like an object. Um, and um, so basically, you should ask for CRA pre-approval. In the old days, I used to say two months, old days, meaning like a year and a half ago. Um, but now it's getting longer and longer. Um, and you can't just send in new objects to CRA and say, is this OK? You need to send in objects plus a detailed description of each of the uh, the new objects that you're proposing and then CRA can review it often they will be okay with it or they will just request minor changes to it or something like that or they have some questions about something maybe you didn't give enough information on something and then they approve it it's not a charity application you are a charity it's only a question of are they okay with the new objects and you don't want to generally change your objects 
uh, without uh, getting their pre-approval. And you can read CRA's guidance on draft purposes for charitable registration. Um, essentially, any, docu any objects that are from before 2013 may not meet the standard CRA would require right now. And I've seen groups go to CRA to say, oh, we just changed the number of directors, you know, like the range or something. So it's got nothing to do with objects. But then CRA looks at the objects and they say, well, yeah, you made that change, but we actually now have a problem with your objects and you should. So to avoid a lot of hassles and uh, and wasted time and everything for many groups, it's a good idea just to think about what are your objects. And especially during COVID, we had a lot of this where groups had narrow objects, didn't think about what happens if, and uh, they weren't able to do the things they wanted to do, which is unfortunate, okay? Then corporate law changes. There's different corporate law changes going on, but the big one right now is Ontario. Um, we have uh, 61,000 uh, nonprofits under the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, or ONCA, uh, what was formerly the Ontario Corporations Act. So I'll just highlight for them, if you're thinking of top corporate or top legal issues for a group, um, about 15,000 of these are um, charities, um, and then there's a whole bunch of other nonprofits that are under ONCA, and these groups have to make changes um, over the next year. In fact, yesterday was the uh, one-year anniversary, so two-year, second-year anniversary, so we have one more year to make the changes, okay? And basically, um, so ONCA came in in 2010. This really affects what we used to call Ontario Corporations Act nonprofits, or now ONCA groups. Um, there were changes made to ONCA. It was brought in in 2021. So October 19, 2021, that's when it's brought in. And there's a three-year period that you have to make changes, and there's less than a year left. At the same time, a new thing was brought in called the Ontario Business Registry. This is relevant also to other groups that are outside of Ontario, because if you carry on any activities in Ontario, you might need to register in the under the OBR, but it's not a big deal. But just so that you're aware that part does affect non-Ontario groups, but most of the other things here are really just for the Ontario groups, uh, this little piece here. Uh, and generally, I'm still of the view that if you're going to just set up a random uh, non-profit or charity across the country in you know, northern BC or wherever, you're generally best off to just do a federal corporation. Gives you potentially more flexibility and also especially uh, if you happen to move your operations from one province to another you don't have to maintain uh, your um, office in that uh, province that you originally set up in so just generally if you want to save a lot of aggravations down the road usually federal is better um, I find still however some lawyers who don't do many of them they just are doing the same thing over and over and they've been doing it for 30 years the same thing but uh, usually uh, federal is the best approach. So some big picture things for these Ontario Corps to really think about. So one is, you know, if you have one entity or six entities is, you know, do you need them all? Do you want to dissolve some of them, et cetera? Um, then another thing is your governance and membership. Is it sort of working for the organization? Because there's sort of a difference between, um, you know, something that is, um, you know, very good and it seems to work versus something that is like, uh, very difficult, complicated, and and stuff like that. So we, you you know sometimes some of these changes are going to be more like technical, you know, changes and less uh, major changes. But we have had some organizations, for example, that'll have twelve or fifteen thousand members. It's very cumbersome. It's expensive to maintain, and they want to make changes. That's a huge change that requires a lot of thought. Then, um, and basically, we try to say. You've got to focus on this and get it done within, you know, before October of 2024, but you don't want to have it distract you from all the other and things you need to do. This is something that happens about every 50 years or 100 years. So it's something that's probably good. And especially since it for charities, it involves multiple regulators, get a, a lawyer who's involved, who understands charity law and governance and all that other stuff. Now, the other thing is, and especially for charities, the issue of the objects is very important because uh, for charities, it, even if your objects are ones that are CRA approved, and especially before 2013, that doesn't mean it's still acceptable for CRA. So you're best off to just get uh, pre-approval from them on that. Okay. Um, the other thing is, so what are the options really for an organization? The first option really is what I think most will do is if you're an Ontario Corp, you just stay in Ontario you're going to have to change all of your governing documents. This is not a bylaw change. This is your letters patent, supplementary letters patent, and bylaws. All of them being changed. You want to basically make them comply with ONCA. And so you'll have articles of amendment. You'll have new bylaws. 
and you'll pass restated articles of incorporation. Um, so you have to have meetings of the board and the members and you have to pass everything and do it. OK, so that's one option. The second option really is to move to federal if you're an Ontario Corp, for some, it's obvious you should move to federal, like you're a national organization or something. For others, it's, it, it may not be that important. And so fine, just stay in Ontario. That's okay. I think there's a lot of misinformation about this whole thing. One of the big things is people think most of the time is spent on things like making the is putting the draft corporate documents together. That's maybe less than 20% of the time. A lot of it is getting the company key. It's updating the information the Ontario government currently has on your organization. It's getting CRA approval if you need that as a registered charity, et cetera, et cetera. It's discussing with the client, you know, what is the right choices to make, et cetera. So um, I have people, I feel so sorry for them. They spend six months or a year working on a bylaw and then we look at it and we say we we can't use this bylaw and a law clerk prepares a bylaw in 15 minutes or 20 minutes that is the right thing and we can adjust it a little bit here and there where we need it but i'm just pointing out that um it's uh, it's not really mainly about the actual documents themselves so get help quickly where you can on this with a lawyer who can help you and uh, try to get that done Another thing is, keep in mind, we talk about charitable activities, and then there's non-charitable activities. So we're not talking prohibited activities, really bad things that you're not allowed to do, but we're talking about things that you might end up doing or would be very important for your organization, but they're not considered charitable. So the big ones really are administration, then there's fundraising, there's related business, and there's social activities. So I'll talk about administration and social a little bit. Um, admin, I'm hoping CRA will actually put out a guidance on admin at some point in the next uh, year or two, uh, because it's very important. Uh, and um, I think especially with donors, um, it's important that CRA validate that having good administrative systems and things is uh, important. Um, um, so that's on the admin side. So you're allowed to do it, you know, a reasonable amount, etc. You're allowed to pay for things. Um, but obviously, you can't have like 90% of all your money going to admin, that would be inappropriate. So when they give out guidance, it'll be good to see right now, there's less certainty about what is an appropriate amount. Um, but obviously, it depends from organization to organization. If you're doing complicated international activities in dangerous countries, and you're spending like less than 10% on admin, I'd have a, a lot of questions about, uh, are you doing things dangerously, inappropriately, et cetera. So social, you're allowed to do some social activities, but obviously if a group is mainly doing social activities, um, it could be a big problem. Uh, so um, that's something just to, to watch. So that's on the non-charitable activities. Something that's gotten a lot of attention in the last year is this um, issue of dealing with non-qualified donees, and that is non-charities. So can a Canadian charity provide funds to a non-charity? And the answer is yes, they've been able to do it for decades. Um, but uh, we'll explain a little bit more about it so that you're aware of it, so that you can keep it in mind. Um, so if you're thinking from an income tax point of view and charities, you could say the world is divided into two when it comes to this uh, you know, charity regulation. There are what are called qualified donees and they're what are called non-qualified donees. So the qualified donees are groups that can issue official donation receipts for income tax purposes. Uh, those are the qualified donees and there's a whole bunch of categories, main one being charities, but also municipalities and uh, certain indigenous bands and other things, different, different categories. So that's qualified donees. Non-qualified donees are everyone else it's, uh, that basically cannot issue an official donation receipt under the Income Tax Act. That's individuals, for-profit companies, uh, non-profits that are not charities, foreign charities, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So this is how it's divided. Uh, the good news is you only need really one set of systems in order to work with about 7 billion different groups around the world or people, okay? Like there's, that's the good news. One set of rules, and once you know them, you can work with just about anyone, obviously not a terrorist organization or someone bad like that, but you can work with for-profits, non-profits, et cetera. So you want to know this set of rules if you're in a charity that wants to do this type of work. Um, so if in doubt as to whether it's a listed, uh, like it's, it's a qualified donee, the good news is since about 2012, 2014, they now pretty much have all of them listed on the CRA website. So you can go and search. The most common search is registered charity, but then you've got RC AAAs, about 150 of them. You now have 10 registered journalism organizations. You have a few listed housing corporations. You've got municipalities in different provinces, which do a lot of good work and could be good for, for example, you want to give them money, um, you know, then that's, it's very easy to do. So basically what we're going to talk about is there's a qualified donees. That's easy for a charity generally to give money to, but then non-qualified donees, there's certain 
systems that need to be put in place because they don't have all the oversight and requirements that a charity has. Um, and then there's a there's a category here of qualified donees that I particularly like. It's called the listed municipal or public body performing a function of government in Canada. This includes about 500 indigenous bands as well as about 50 or so school boards and other groups and things. Uh, it's grown tremendously and it's a very important category if you're interested in uh, indigenous uh, reconciliation and other issues like that. Then there's another one that I find interesting, which is the universities that are listed outside of Canada. Basically, they have, um, there's about 650 groups outside of Canada. There are universities that typically have two Canadian students studying at them. They can get on the list quite easily, and then um, you can make donations to them or an individual can donate to them, et cetera. There's this little category. It only has one on it right now, listed charitable organization outside of Canada to which Her Majesty in the right of Canada has made a gift, not provided funds, made a gift. And so it's a very small group that meets that category categorization. And then you've got the federal government, provincial government, the UN and its agencies. Those are groups, you could call it a club. Those are qualified donees. Moving money between them from a CRA perspective is pretty straightforward. Um, however, in many cases, you don't want to just give another charity money that is a Canadian registered charity. You might want to, for example, work with a group in India, or you might want to work with a nonprofit in Canada and things. And all those other groups, they are not able to issue official donation receipts. Therefore, they're not qualified donees, and you're not allowed to make gifts to them. Uh, so foreign charities, Canadian nonprofits with no charitable status, businesses, celebrities, things like that. Okay. And so there's a new guidance that came out. And I'll talk about it. Um, it's a draft that's um, out there. And uh, hopefully in the next few months, we'll see a revised version of this draft. But even then, I think there's going to be lots of questions about the new rules. But let's try to just situate these new rules. This was the old situation. At the top, you had a registered charity. On the left, it could give in the green money to qualified donees, make gifts, basically. On the right-hand side, it could have employees and volunteers doing work or it could have a non-qualified donee that's hired in a structured arrangement to do work. That was the original rules that we've had uh, for decades. Then what has changed now is that there's this concept of qualifying disbursements, and it includes two very different things, a gift to a qualified donee, but then also a grant to a grantee organization. Um, that's what the new rules is, this red box, if you will. Okay, And on the right, it's the same. Nothing's uh, changed there except for some additional uh, anti-avoidance rules we'll talk about. So basically, what does this mean? This means that the red box and the blue box are very similar. The difference is we have 30 years of information on the blue box and how it should work, whereas in the red box, we have very little information, lots of questions. And um, we're not generally suggesting groups use the red box at the moment until there is greater certainty about certain things. But if you absolutely had to, one could follow those rules. And it's in this guidance that I had just mentioned. Uh, sorry, I've got to go backwards here. It's in this guidance here that would give you a lot of the ideas. But there's a lot there uh, to take in. But if you want to go under the old rules, essentially, it's there's two guidances, one for Canada, one for operating abroad um, that have the information. And it's what we used to call a structured arrangement with direction control. And so many people were confused. They thought they'd gotten rid of this. No, they didn't get rid of it. They just added another way of doing it, which is a bit different, but also in some ways, um, in some ways better, but in many ways worse. So just be aware of that. So the normal rules, if you wanted to give money to a foreign group, let's say to do work, you'd have to do these sort of eight measures of control. And as long as you do these eight measures of control, you're allowed to transfer. And you know, there are some Canadian charities sending hundreds of millions of dollars abroad. And if you follow the rules, then there's no problem with that. Okay. And so, um, and uh, as I said, for until there's greater certainty on those new rules, then I would not suggest using the grant to grantee, rather use the direction and control, that sort of thing. So what is this grant to grantee? So it's saying that a registered charity may make a qualifying disbursement to a non-qualified donee, but it's, it's a qualifying disbursement. It's not a gift, okay, to a non-qualified donee, which they call a grantee organization, which is confusing, but we'll just leave it at that. It says, provided that... The disbursement furthers a charitable purpose of the charity. So there you get back to purposes. What are your purposes? If it isn't in your purpose and it's something you're doing, but it's charitable, it doesn't qualify as a qualifying disbursement. So very important to look at your purposes if you're going to use these rules. But the part that really I would say is most uh, interesting, if you will, is the second one, where basically we're talking about ensures the charity ensures, ensures that the disbursement is exclusively applied by the grantee organization 
to charitable activities in furtherance of a charitable purpose. So if you give $100,000 to a group, you're going to have to make sure that every cent of that basically is spent on charitable activities, not on admin or anything else. Um, so this, unfortunately, is not, um, um, I think, for many groups going to be so easy to do. Um, and insurer is not like you should try on a balance of probabilities. It's it's really a high level there. Okay. And you have to maintain documentation sufficient to demonstrate the above. The documentation is probably going to be significantly more than what you would have to have sometimes in the other case of a, a direction and control uh, relationship. Um, so, you know, CRA says if you're trying to ensure that it's going to be used, uh, they have a whole bunch of things in there about risk matrix, looking at, you know, your experience, the grantees experience, the, where it's happening, the amount involved, private benefit concerns, uh, nature of the resources granted. So cash versus, say, medical supplies, the grant duration, a lot of different issues you have to take into account. You really have to think it through. And um, and so you you want to be careful about that. But I'll be honest with you, the big issue isn't that one. That's just that now you could say you can continue on doing direction control and you have another option. So if you don't want to use that option, don't use it. But what is a little bit more worrying for many organizations at the moment is this one, which is that before we had a conduit, you can't be a conduit. But if you basically were to take in money and have it go to another group and there was direction and control, you weren't considered a conduit. But now there's a new set of rules that came in, which is 168.1F of the Income Tax Act, which is the part where um, the government, 168.1 is where they can revoke charities, right? Um, and so what it's saying is there's a new ground to revoke a charity. A charity can be revoked when the registered charity accepts a gift, the granting of which was expressly or implicitly conditional on the charity association or organization making a gift to essentially a, a non-qualified donee. OK, so this is um, I think it's more than just the normal conduit rule. Um, and basically, um, if you do this, um, it can be a problem. So if you accept Joe gives you five hundred dollars, but Joe says he wants that to go to another group in a foreign country, you can be revoked for that. Joe's receipt will not be valid. So that's a lot of things that you've got to just watch here. It won't affect all groups because many groups, they spend all the money on their own program right inside their own shop with their own employees, et cetera. They don't give any money away to anyone. But for other groups that are trying to do the stuff, they've got to be now supremely careful. A big foundation used to sometimes give money to another charity and you know, with the expectation that that money will be divided amongst certain other groups that maybe they had direction and control over those relationships. Uh, now you do that, that charity can be revoked. So you've got to be very careful to really think through what is um, what you're doing, both on a fundraising side, you're bringing in the money, what are you telling donors? Um, and by the way, um, any emails you have, CRA can ask for. I just put up a 150 page letter that CRA wrote to one organization and, you know, they're looking at all their emails. Um, so in other words, what you say on your website is one thing, but also what you say in the emails. And it's not just what you say, it's what other people say. So people writing to you um, that maybe don't understand all these things, but they think it is something. And then CRA will say, well, why did they think it was that? So just pointing out that this is uh, going to be a very easy way for CRA to get rid of a charity in the future if uh, charities are not really thinking carefully about that one. Okay. So as I mentioned, it affects fundraising and it affects grant making. So money coming in, money going out, and you should really pay attention to that. Um, so there's been a lot of changes in this area and misunderstandings about the change. Uh, some people think you're now allowed to make gifts to foreign groups and things. Absolutely not. Um, and it doesn't replace, replace the current options that you always had, which is gifts to qualified donees, using staff to implement programs, using volunteers to implement programs, using non-qualified donees as part of a structured arrangement with direction and control. Those are still there. And for many groups, that would be the right thing to do. And here's just some additional information if it's helpful. Fundraising. So fundraising is a funny thing because a lot of groups do it. And for a lot of groups, it's very important. But if you look at the whole charity sector, I just want to give some context. Uh, if, uh, say, 20 to $25 billion is coming in a year from fundraising, it's actually only about like 7% of the total revenue. Um, but if you think of some people in their view of the charity sector, they think the whole charity sector runs on fundraising exclusively pretty much. Um, but in fact, it's actually a very tiny part of the money that the charity sector has. Okay. 
Um, it tends to get a lot of attention because people take it very personally. If you give $100 to a charity, you feel like this charity is your charity. And if they do something wrong, um, it's different than if government gives money, which is also your money. Um, but in that case, uh, you don't feel as close to it. Um, the main point I would just make is CRA has a fundraising guidance. It's online. Anyone, any charity who does fundraising, any individual who does fundraising, really take a look at it. They spent a lot of time on it. It will be revised shortly, um, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, if, if uh, until then, this is really what the the document is. Okay, and um, the the big things are there is appropriate and inappropriate fundraising by charities. So, for example, if it's deceptive or it's illegal or you're paying fundraisers far too much, so it's more than an incidental private benefit or something like that, then um, there will be concerns. And then when CRA is looking at your charity, they'll look at a whole bunch of factors um, and you need to just make sure that each factor is okay. Uh, so for example, fundraising expenses to revenue ratio is one example. Um, you know, And there are other things here. Inappropriate purchasing, so buying chocolate bars for $2 uh, and then selling them for two fifty. Um, you know, meanwhile, you could maybe buy the chocolate bar for fifty cents and sell it for two fifty. That would be an example of you bought something and you paid too much for it. And we're not talking about one chocolate bar. We're talking about a million chocolate bars or a hundred thousand chocolate bars. It adds up to a lot of money very quickly, right? Anytime most of the money goes to contracted non-charitable parties, so third party fundraisers are paid, that would also raise issues they will look at. Anytime there's commission-based fundraiser remuneration, CRA will be looking at whether it's appropriate, the relationship. Um, many groups like the Association of Fundraising Professionals and CAGP and AHP and others, they prohibit commission-based fundraising for many reasons. Um, but the CRA is not, its job is not to uh, enforce uh, ethical standards. Um, their job is to enforce the Income Tax Act. So if a commission-based arrangement resulted in an undue private benefit or something like that, or too much money for the fundraiser, then CRA would have a big problem with that. So you've got to really watch these things. Misrepresentations in fundraising solicitations or in disclosure can be a big concern for CRA. Um, anytime you do a lot of fundraising and it's not well documented, that's also a concern. There are a few factors that they tend to realize they, they should cut some slack. One is the size of the charity, a new small charity. Uh, maybe they would, in some cases, cut them some slack. Or if you're dealing with something that is less appealing than something else. So, for example, helping ex-cons to get jobs is less appealing to, to many people than helping children with cancer. So they'll understand that the costs might be higher and things like that. Long-term donor development programs like Bequest can have higher costs. So they, they understand that. Anytime you're involved with gaming activities, it's a provincial law really area. CRA just says clock all your costs, but they, you know, if you do a lottery or something, it could be a 90% cost sometimes of these things. So you might only make a small amount. CRA doesn't use the, they generally, as long as you're complying with the law, they will not use that high number, uh, you know, and factor it into your, although you do have to include it in your T3010 filings as a fundraising cost, they won't sort of view it in terms of the ratio as being uh, the same problem as other fundraising. And so just so that you know, the fundraising ratio just very quickly is essentially that you are, um, if it's under 35 cents, per dollar that it costs you to raise money. Generally, CRA is not going to have a problem with that. They're generally okay with it. If it's between 35 and 70%, they will be asking questions. And if it's over 70%, uh, they'll definitely potentially have problems, but expect that there's an explanation. I mean, you might have started fundraising a month before the end of the year, so you have some costs, you don't have any revenue. That could be an example of how it could be potentially in a year so high. Um, but most groups, it just also fluctuates depending on when people donate, depending on things that happen. So it can fluctuate. And then they'll look at uh, basically a multi-year approach. Uh, what is your typical cost? But let's take an example. Let's say you're a fundraising organization who has hired one telemarketer to do the work. They charge you a 90% uh, commission. Um, and basically you get 10% of the money, they get 90%. Um, and you do this for you know a number of years in a row, CRA is going to pretty much probably revoke your organization. They'll say that you're not uh, concerned with the amount of cost and especially if it's the brother your brother or sister that you've hired to to do that work so just keep this in mind fundraising ratio it's one of many things that CRA looks at employment issues um, we have about two and a half million uh, people working in the charity sector this is quite important that uh, sometimes uh, one of the big issues is 
people calling themselves independent contractors, but they're actually employees. That can result in a host of problems, um, but that's one of the issues. And a lot of this is quite similar to what you'd have in the for-profit context. And it often starts off quite, you know, you know, simply, which is that, you know, someone's hired for one hour a month to do bookkeeping. And, you know, maybe they are an independent contractor, they have 20 clients and, and things like that. But then it moves to they're working uh, a week a month, and then it becomes they're working uh, 60 hours a week, every week for the organization, but they're just upping the numbers, and they're still calling themselves an independent contractor. And meanwhile, the person doesn't really have any other clients at this point, they're really an employee in all likelihood. Um, but you know, things to just watch out. You don't want to miscategorize people. And if you have to, if in doubt, make them an employee, because at least then you deal with it in a system and you deduct certain amounts. And then you, uh, after you've withheld those amounts, you remit it to CRA because your directors and your organization can be on the hook if monies are not remitted to, to CRA. And then proper employment agreements just realize that many of the employment agreements, like for example, in Ontario that were signed a few years ago are probably not even valid today. Um, and, uh, um, and one thing that is uniquely a charitable thing, it's not really as much a private sector type thing, is just the amount of compensation has to be appropriate, reasonable, necessary, proportionate, no more than fair market value. Um, I've seen people, charities hire someone, let's say for $200,000. And so the question is asked, why? Well, they were making $200,000 at their previous job and they wouldn't come to us unless we paid them the same. Yeah, but their previous job was running a multinational corporation with a billion in revenue. You're a small charity with you know 100000 in revenue. You can't pay someone that sort of money, right? So reasonable, necessary, proportionate, no more than fair market value. And that is only one problem, which is paying people too much. The far bigger problem affecting a lot more people is charities not not even paying minimum wage, let alone a livable wage, uh, which is uh, inappropriate, illegal, etc. So just pointing out that charities need to focus on both issues. Don't pay people too much. And also don't pay people uh, less than they legally are entitled to, like minimum wage and things like that. Political activities, I'll just say a few things about this. Um, 2019, there were some big changes here. Okay. Um, and many groups, I don't think are aware of the changes. So basically, some people think when the word political comes in, it's a dirty word, but it's not really a dirty word. Some parts of political and the way some people act can be pretty bad, but there are parts of political that are quite important and charities are and should be engaged in it. And so essentially anything that involves like changing laws, getting government to allocate resources to certain problems, et cetera. Um, this is political. So, I mean, if you said to government, you know, I want government to give more money to families that have children so that they're not starving or something, that's considered political, but it's not a bad thing to do. So I think it's really important to just keep in mind that sometimes some of the biggest impacts that charities can have are actually by engaging in uh, political activities, okay? Um, but also realize that some charities have done completely inappropriate political activities on the right, on the left, all over the place. Um, and that is not appropriate and it shouldn't be extolled as a good thing. Um, there are rules that have to be complied with. The other thing, just from a complexity point of view, is we'll talk about the Income Tax Act and its rules, but remember there's Election Act rules and there's Lobbying Act rules, and they may be on multiple levels, okay? So depending on which province you're in or which city you're in, if you're lobbying the city of Toronto, for example, there would be different rules perhaps than if you're lobbying the city of Winnipeg or the federal government, okay? But so the old rules, we used to call them the 10% rule. Because for big organizations that every year spend 10%, you could only spend 10%. But it actually probably should have been called the 60% rule because for smaller organizations, which is most charities, and most don't be, they're not constantly involved with political, it meant they could spend up to 60% um, on political in, in one year. And then, you know, that was sort of how it worked. Um, there were maybe about 50 or 100 groups that wanted to spend more than 10%, but they made enough of a ruckus about it that they got all the rules basically changed, uh, except for the you can't do partisan political activities. That hasn't changed. But so what are the rules as of 2018, 2019? Right now, a charity, let's say it uh, takes in 100 million a year, can spend all 100 million on nonpartisan political activities, what we're now calling public policy, dialogue, and development activities, or PPDDAs, okay? These PPDDAs have to be connected to your stated charitable purposes, so those are actually your real charitable purposes in there, and uh, you also have to avoid directly supporting or indirectly supporting a political party or a candidate, okay? So you can't do the partisan stuff, but you can do nonpartisan political activities, and so what does this mean? This means that if someone, for example, wants to study 
immigration to this country because they think that immigration is a bad thing and all that. They can take a hundred million in a year and spend a hundred million on research and education and other things relating to, uh, you know, immigration. Um, whereas in the old days, you know, if you're a big group and you're constantly involved with political, you could spend 10%. And I like that more, to be frank. Um, I think this allows, it's not about free speech. Everyone as an individual can, you know, do their own little piece or whatever, or you could move to a different group, uh, like a nonprofit that isn't constrained. But right now there are charities who are doing no charitable activity. They're just doing political activities, and some of them are pretty extreme groups. And sometimes you have people on two extreme sides, and it's getting this huge tax subsidy. So I think someone at some point is going to have to look at this and ask some questions around whether this is such a great system we have. It's following the American system where they passed uh, Citizens United in 2010. And we've seen what happened with the American system. It wasn't great, and it's still not great today. But a lot of that's about money and politics. Wealthy billionaires basically buying off Supreme Court judges and all sorts of other things. This is what is basically happening in the U.S., and we're allowing it to happen here in Canada, unfortunately. And that's so that's on political. Another thing that comes up a lot is what people call social enterprise, the ability for a charity to run essentially a business activity. There's a lot of ability for charity to run for charities to run business activities. In fact, earned income is more than fundraising by charities. So charities bringing in money from various sort of business type activities, et cetera. It's more money than um, is, is from donations. So it's quite important. Pub, uh, private foundations can't do any business activities, but uh, charitable organizations and public foundations can do what are called related business activities. And uh, so let's start with just what is a business because not everything involving money is a business. So an activity is commercial in nature. You're deriving revenue and the providing goods and services. You have to have the intention to earn a profit and it has to be continuous. So if you had, for example, a bake sale for one day a year to raise money for your charity, that would not be considered a continuous activity. It's not a business. Uh, therefore, it would be maybe a fundraising initiative. But if you have a bakery every day selling baked goods and your charity is um, involved with it, and you have um, you're doing it on a a, a, ba a certain basis, then it could be considered a business activity. Um, just keep in mind because some people forget this, but there are reasons why you don't want charities like doing mainly or only business activities because you know they're tax free and all this other stuff. So there's many reasons why we don't want to make it that you can just do any business activity in a charity. And then the question of what is the right amount, one can debate. But just keep in mind, in some countries, they allow more of these un these related business activities, but they tax the whole thing. So for many groups, if they change the system in Canada, you'd be far worse off. Like some hospitals make a ton of money off their parking lots, and they're not paying any tax on that. But if you change the rules to say, well, now you have to, you, you can do more different things, but you have to pay tax, they're going to lose huge amounts of money. So I'm just pointing out that our rules are what they are, and one tries, if you can, to work within them. But realize if you change them, just like with foreign activities, you might end up with something worse than what you had before. Um, so there are really two types of related business. I'll jump to number two because it's the easiest. If you can run a business and 90 plus percent of the people are volunteers, they're not getting paid anything, then you really can do any type of business your charity wants to do. And that's very easy, except getting consistent volunteers with the right skills to do the work for more complicated business is very difficult. Okay. The main one, which is where you're paying people, um, you know, um, it's a business where it's linked to a charity's purposes and subordinate to that purpose. So a hospital parking lot, a church gift shop, things like that. So a hospital parking lot is linked to the hospital's purposes because it's next to the hospital providing parking for people who need it. Um, that's how it's linked. Um, subordinate, well, maybe the hospital parking lot's bringing in 20 million a year and the hospital's are 500 million. So it's subordinate. It's less than, shall we say, 50%. It's not bigger than the actual work of the hospital. Um, so it has to be linked and subordinate. But if you took a hospital parking lot and said, okay, we're going to set up a hospital parking lot 20 kilometers away from the hospital, one would say, well, that's not really linked. That's just a parking lot then at that point. And by the way, you can do that. You just would not have it in a charity. You would have it in a for-profit entity that is uh, maybe owned completely by a charity, and that would be okay. But I'm just sort of generally pointing out that um, if it's not linked, it can't be a related business if you're using staff to to run the thing um, and you're not meeting the 90% volunteer threshold. 
Um, but another possibility is what happens if it's not a hospital, but it's just a healthcare clinic? If it's a healthcare clinic, then you would have, let's say, a $500,000 budget and it's a $20 million parking lot. It wouldn't be considered subordinate. So it's important that you're both linked and subordinate. Again, it gets back to what are your charitable purposes and are they up to date and relevant and helpful, uh, that sort of thing. So this is what is a related business. And if you want to read, it's unfortunately from 2003, 20 years old, but CRA has guidance on what is a related business. Another thing I'm just going to mention is gift restrictions because many groups get into trouble with this. Um, if a charity accepts a gift with a restriction on it, the charity needs to comply with the restriction. I think... That would seem to be like a trite statement, but many people don't fully understand what that means. That means that you have to comply with it and it cannot be changed unless the charity obtains a court order, a Cypre order, um, which is often hard to get. And sometimes it's just not possible because the standards are so high to get these things. Um, or you have a provision for amendment uh, in your gift agreement. And that's where we have a problem that many of the gift agreements used by many charities are not up to scruff. And literally missing just a few sentences in a gift agreement can mean a whole host of problems for the charity. And sometimes groups will come to us only when they realize there's a problem after they've raised $100 million. And it might be that there's very little that can be done to fix the problem. If they had just spent a half an hour thinking about these issues, uh, a year earlier, they wouldn't have these problems. But uh, so unfortunately, the biggest myth is that if you have a restricted gift and there isn't an amendment clause in the gift agreement, the myth is that the charity and the donor can just get together just like any contract and they can make changes after the gift is made. And the problem is this is a gift. It's not a general contract. Um, the, the donor doesn't at that point have the ability to do that. They haven't reserved the right. So this is just something that is really important to keep in mind. Uh, many charities have poor gift agreements. Um, in fact, the other issue is many charities don't have a full understanding of all the gifts that they have. And uh, there's a proposal, and we'll see how it all plays out, that many charities are going to have to, as of beginning of next year in 2024, file T3 forms potentially for every single restricted gift where, you know, there's like money, like a multi-year gift, for example, and things like that. So many charities are going to have to really be looking closely at gift agreements, um, whether there are restrictions, what the restrictions are. Do they need to file a T3? This is in addition to the T3010 that you file. Um, I'm hoping for some clarifications from CRA on that. Okay. And restricted gifts, I get it. Sometimes it's easier to fundraise for restricted gifts. And, you know, donors are well-intentioned, but knowing what is going to be the right thing for a charity in a year's time, let alone five years or 10 years is very hard. Um, not only the donors, but even the staff knowing what is in the best interest of the group, where you're going to have too much money, where you're going to have too little. So very important that you are careful about these uh, restricted gifts. Try to dissuade where possible. Try to not use it any more than you need to, because it really can undermine the mission. You could look like a rich charity, but you don't have the money to spend on what you want. Um, and so there are a lot of charities that have a lot of assets that are basically insolvent. Some of them are unfortunately dipping into, they call it lending or something, but it's really breach of trust. They're taking money without authorization from a restricted fund and using it for something else, hoping that maybe in the future they'll get more money. And of course, it's like a gambling uh, addiction or something. You think it's going to, you'll, you'll get that big win and everything will be okay, but the big win never happens and then eventually it blows up, right? So um, if a large proportion of your funds are restricted, it can make financial management and planning very difficult. Um and also, if you have a lot of money just sitting around that you can't deploy because it's hard because of the restrictions, it also makes you look like a wealthy organization and people are less likely to give money to you. So it has lots of uh, different uh, problems. The other thing is that, so just a little few tips on preventing problems with restrictions. You can refuse restrictions, but you may lose the gift. Or you can suggest restrictions to donors that are broad and compatible with the areas of greatest need. So you're more likely to be able to actually use it. And really, you want to try and negotiate if you have to have a restriction, uh, one that's as broad as possible. Um, you can accept the restrictions. And in some cases, it's not that bad. Like maybe you want to buy a piece of equipment and you have, you're only going to take in, you know, $2 million worth of restricted uh, funds for that. And the piece of equipment costs, you know, more money than that. So it's not a problem. But often you're either raising too little or too much, almost never the exact right amount that you need. Um, but so some groups, um, honestly, if you said to many groups, I'll give you this restricted gift or I'll give you an unrestricted gift, they'd rather take half the money you were going to give uh, because sometimes they need it or sometimes they would take 10% of the money. Um, so it's really something to think about, have staff think about, 
Um, how are we encouraging more unrestricted gifts and less restricted gifts? I also find sometimes people don't realize something's restricted. They think it's not restricted, but it actually is. Um, so ensure this clear communication with your donors, um, ensure the necessary caveats, provisions, and things like that in a gift agreement, because it's not just the, the charity that's going to get disappointed. If a donor had given money for something very specific that can't be done, or it's just not needed to be done because maybe government is now doing it or something, um, they will want that money to be reallocated, but they may not be easy for you to reallocate it. Okay. So try to maintain as much flexibility as possible. I think that was something we learned. So some, the biggest mistakes made by charities, they're not aware of a compliance requirement or issue. So hopefully you've gotten some ideas from this and we'll be circulating uh, to you guys, a uh, essentially a checklist of top sort of CRA compliance issues. Um, and hopefully you'll find that helpful if you're trying to work out is your organization covering off at least the most important, some of the most important issues. So just some groups not aware of the issue. Some are not recognizing that every charity is different and maybe one type of group has a different requirement and that sort of thing. Um, some are a little bit arrogant, you know, like for example, when it comes to receding, they'll tell me we know what we're doing and we do it right and we have very good systems and everything's great. And then someone else shows me some receipts and I realize that a lot of the stuff they're not doing is right. So um, it's um, important that you rather get help a few years before CRA comes in, then, uh, you know, obviously, if necessary, get it two weeks before the CRA comes actually into your thing. Uh, but best would be many years before get it done now. Uh, some charities are very focused on compliance. I feel sorry for some of these, um, but they're focused on the wrong issue. So they're putting in a lot of effort, but they're looking at the wrong stuff. And uh, therefore, they're terribly non-compliant, but they're, they're doing the effort I I that you could be very compliant, which is sad. Um, you know, charity sector is very sharing. People want to help out others and they give the best advice they can, but often what advice they're giving or thoughts they're giving are just completely wrong. Maybe that was right 20 years ago, but it's not right today. Maybe it was never right, et cetera. Um, assuming that a big charity does it, so then it's probably acceptable. They probably had lawyers review it and stuff like that. No, what I find generally is big charities tend to be more non-compliant with than smaller charities because big charities tend to have, um, uh, sometimes more complexity, more different types of programs, more different things. So um, they will tend to have more compliance issues than a small group that does one thing. And as long as they make sure a few things are done, they probably uh, will be fine. Okay. Thinking that the legal answer is the answer. Remember ethics and reputation. And in some cases, there's up-to-date charity rules on things. Some of the rules are 50 years old, 100 years old, and they may be perfectly legal, but highly unethical. And you don't want to fall into that trap. So running a registered charity is a privilege. It's not a right. Try to do your best. I would argue focus initially on the highest visibility, highest risk problems that are the easiest to fix. We often with our clients are reactive. Uh, they come to us with a very specific thing. Oh, I want to change my bylaw, this paragraph or whatever. And we respond to it. But if you're asking me what is the best way to respond to dealing with compliance, it's not to be reactive. It's to actually just sit down for an hour or two and say, look, what are you doing? How do you do this stuff? Uh, look at a few searches and reports and things, because often one can very quickly pick up things that are problematic and groups just are completely unaware that there is even a problem. And get help with different areas. There's legal accounting, financial management, investment, HR, et cetera, especially with larger charities where it's just so complicated. Uh, one person's just not going to know everything that you need. Um, and if you get revoked, there's reputational issues, obviously, but also your directors and officers, senior staff, et cetera, may become ineligible individuals, which means they can't be involved with a, at a senior position running another charity. So for a fundraiser whose job is fundraising, you may not be able to work for five years or for the rest of your life in the charity sector. Um, so very important to make sure that you avoid those sort of things. And if you're interested, we have a lot of online courses that may be helpful for you. If you're interested in particular things, they're available 24 seven. Okay. So happy to take some questions and I can see that there are some uh, that are in the box here and I can try and respond to them. Will you cover the new trust reporting rules? I did cover them, um, but uh, we're, I'm still waiting to see if um, if um, CRA puts out something. It's not the charities directorate of CRA. It's the, uh, the trust uh, section puts out something, and I'm hoping that they will exempt charities from having to file the T3s. But the problem is our transparency is really not great when it comes to charities. Our T3010 is almost a joke compared to like the American forms where they ask for so much more. So I don't think it's just going to be either 
at least I, I think it's probably best if it isn't, you don't have to file the T3 end of story. It has to be, you don't have to file the T3, but we have to have, especially for bigger groups, like ones maybe that have a million in uh, assets or uh, 10 million in uh, restricted gifts, um, they they should be pulling it, they, a new schedule to the T3010, which would be so much simpler than having to file 50 or 500 of these T3 forms. But unfortunately, I've been sort of uh, saying this for a long time. Um, and I sent to CRA a, a letter about two years ago that I put up on my blog, if you want to read it, about how they just ask like seven questions. And I had said, even just ask it of some of the biggest groups, like the top 500 foundations, you know, because the foundation sector is sitting on $130 billion. And there are groups like the Financial Action Task Force, OECD, and others that are very concerned about money, that they don't know who it is, uh, who could benefit from it, what are the strings attached, who's in control. Um, and so we're getting a lot of international pressure here in Canada. And so now we're going down this T3 thing, which is a little bit crazy, uh, but we'll wait and see. And I'm hoping for the best, but you know, start preparing for the worst. What I would suggest for groups is at least make sure you've got a really up-to-date list of every single restricted gift, what the restrictions are, and a whole bunch of other things. Because whether you have to file the T3 or not, that's still a very good thing for you to have. You can't have restricted gifts and then not know about all of them and what you're supposed to do or not do with them. That's a disaster in the making. Okay. So uh, anyway, that hopefully answers your T3 uh, sort of question. Um a uh, question around deferring a donation to a future year. Do I also defer the issuance of a tax receipt to donor even if received cash in current year? I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, if a person is deferring a donation to another year, that means they're giving you the donation, say, next year. They haven't given you a donation. So next year, they will have given you a donation. You'll issue a receipt next year um, or by the following February, you know, usually CRA suggests one should at least issue them by then if you're going to issue receipts at all. Um, but if you're asking a different question about um, if a person does donate, let's say December 23rd, um, but you're on holiday for a few weeks and you're not able to issue a receipt, yes, you can issue a receipt the following year for the previous year, and it will be for that year. So um, if that was the question, I'm not sure, okay? Um, let me just look here what else there is. Um, I think I've discussed the trust reporting rules. Um, have the changes to the rules regarding the alternative minimum tax been enacted? Um, so my understanding is, unless there's some change, um, the AMT rules will be will be coming in. I've written about it. I'm not going to get into it too much because it actually affects very few people. But um, obviously, some wealthy people will be affected. And then uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, the main thing is that most actual donations of uh, public securities appear to come from corporations are not affected by the AMT system, the alternative minimum tax. So I'm not sure that that is going to be an issue, but we'll we'll wait and see. Um, Mark, I'm just going to jump in yeah, one, sure. one second, please. Um, so one, thank you for the presentation, but I'm just going to let everybody know that if you do have to drop, since we are after the hour, we will be just going to remind everybody that we will be recording the Rev the Rev webinar is recorded and we will be sending it to, uh, to everyone. Um, all right. Um, please go ahead, Mark. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the difference between a registered charity and a nonprofit, um, uh, some people are confused about that. I agree. Um, so basically, a registered charity is a income tax thing um, that basically says that if you are listed with the CRA, you could be a registered charity. If you're any other type of nonprofit that is not a registered charity, I mean, you could be another type of qualified donee, but otherwise just a normal group like a sports group or something, then you are under the Income Tax Act, perhaps what they call a Section 149-1L nonprofit. And that nonprofit is one that has different rules completely than what a registered charity has, okay? Um, the big thing really just to keep in mind, I guess, is that because if you're not a registered charity, it doesn't mean because you are set up under a corporate act like the, the CNCA or ONCA or you know the BC Societies Act, it doesn't actually mean you're a nonprofit. It means corporately you might be a nonprofit, but CRA actually might view you as being a for-profit. So you've got to just make sure that you're complying with the rules. Um, otherwise, the nonprofit, um, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of clarity on nonprofits. It's 1917 rules that haven't really been changed. Um, so hopefully we'll see. I've, uh, I was hoping many years ago there would be some clarifications on it. Um, there is no list of nonprofits. And even if you're a nonprofit today, Tomorrow, you've changed your activities a bit, you might not be a nonprofit. So these are something that you've just got to constantly be watching if you're a nonprofit that's not a charity, okay? 
With respect to typos on the T3010, uh, if you proactively uh, put in a revised T3010, um, so something like date of birth is missing, or you put a number in the long run, uh, does it, uh, you put a number in the long, wrong line, will that result in you potentially uh, getting audited by CRA? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, obviously, um, it is something that someone will be reviewing and things could come up. But, um, you know, I think one should have a discussion. I mean, if you just don't put in you know, one piece of information, do you then go and do an amended uh, form would be a question I would ask. Because keep in mind also, when you're doing an amendment to it, what you're really saying is you've actually re-reviewed your documents. Everything else is exactly right. And we're just changing this one thing. So I think one should look at that and think about it. And uh, before one just sort of uh, runs to constantly be changing uh, what you're putting in your T3010. Okay. Uh, do we have to show the disbursement quota on the T3010? Well, you, there are certain lines that ask certain questions that can be then used potentially to work out your disbursement quota, but you don't actually put your worksheet and all that information on the T3010. It's not They're not asking for that, um, but there's a certain information that is often not filled in by groups. Um, and for some groups, the disbursement quota of three and a half or 5% is really not relevant to them because they're spending like 70, 80% of their money every year. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to fill in those lines on the T3010 that are important, okay? Um, what is an example of an object that has changed since 2013? Um, just about every type of object is changed since 2013. The way that CRA is saying that you should construct an object is much more uh, rigorous, shall we say, than what was done in the past. Um, 2013 is more about the form. Um, I would say that today, more things can be done that are considered to be charitable than, say, 50 years ago. But there are some things that you could do 50 years ago that would have been considered charitable um, that maybe today wouldn't be considered charitable. But the main issue is just some of the old objects are like four pages long. They largely have secondary objects, not the actual objects. And the way they were written is very broad and vague and wouldn't be acceptable to CRA today. So that's why I'm saying many of the older objects are not great. And by the way, uh, you know, it can be very bad for your organization to have objects that aren't really appropriate for what you need. Um, most of the time, a client asks me if I, as a charity, can they do it? When I say no, it's not because charity law prohibits it. It's because their objects are not good and they haven't been customized to their needs. So I would say all groups should be looking at whether they their objects are appropriate and make sure they're acting within them and things like that. Okay. Um, there's another question here. Uh, qualified donees versus non-qualified donees. What are the rules surrounding a charity giving a donation to a First Nation band that's not listed in the uh, Municipal and Public Service Body group? Um, should you treat them as a non-qualified donee? Yes, unfortunately, the answer is you would need to treat them as a non-qualified donee. The good news is that for a First Nations band, it's actually very simple to get on the list. And there's only about 100 out of the uh, about 650 that aren't really on there. So it's almost all have gotten on and a few others will get on. Um, so encourage them to get on. Um, it doesn't really impose any real obligations other than if they do issue receipts, they have to be appropriate and they have to keep a little bit of books and records, but it doesn't make them into a charity with all the charity rules. So it's a great category to to get on. And if you're interested in uh, indigenous groups being able to fundraise and bring in more money, then I think it's, it's not a bad thing to do. Um, but um, yeah, unfortunately, if they're not a qualified donee, you have to treat them as a non-qualified donee. Um, what are the main changes that are needed for registered charities as a result of ONCA? So the main change really with ONCA is that um, Canadian registered charities, if you're under the Ontario Act, are going to need to redo all of your documents uh, at the top level. So we're talking your letters patent, supplementary letters patent, or letters patent of amalgamation. All those documents need to be done, and your bylaws need to be redone. And they have to be redone in a way that is consistent for the ONCA uh, system, which is not the same as the old way. So what you have in your articles is not the same as the letters patent. What you have in the bylaws is not the same as the bylaws under. So the whole thing just needs to be redone. The good news is the documents, when they're done, like we have like, I don't know, six different bylaws, like just that are different scenarios, different situations for Ontario groups. So if we work out what is the right thing, it's not hard to come up with the documents. That's not the part that's the hardest. The hardest is to work out what do you have right now, updating the corporate registry so the correct information is there, what choices are, have you made, what choices do you want to keep, and then 
implementing it and getting, uh, you know, in some groups, I've written articles on for some groups, the year is just not enough. I mean, uh, registered charities who have large memberships, and there's just a whole bunch of other issues. Um, you know, the year isn't going to be enough. And unfortunately, uh, what will happen is after the October 2024, um, it'll be deemed that this whole ONCA Act uh, sort of overrides your other documents and things. So you're going to be reading your documents thinking they're telling you something. And in fact, it's overwritten here and overwritten there. And so I'm not optimistic about that. I think it's going to be very expensive to get legal advice on things like that. Uh, you're way, it's way cheaper and better. Just replace all the stuff with new stuff that's appropriate for what you what you need. Okay. Um, would you have any information about what would be an appropriate amount for a percentage for administration? Um, I think a lot of funders don't realize the administration is needed to all, do all the reporting, financial processes, et cetera. Um, and I feel that they're very limiting in that uh, percentage. Yeah, absolutely. I've written um, extensive articles on this topic you can find on my uh, CanadianCharityLaw.ca blog. Um, there is no number per se. But it needs to be reasonable, necessary, proportionate, that sort of thing um, for some groups. I mean, I have clients that are huge and their admin ratio is zero. How can they do that? Because they get a related company to pay for everything. But most groups don't have that and can't do that. So an amount like 5 or 10 or 15 percent, depending on the situation of the group, it's like saying how much of a reserve fund should one have? There is no one size fits all. It really depends on, say, 20 factors. And I would say the same is the case when it comes to what percent is appropriate. But I think we should all agree at least that if you're just spending 90% on admin every year, then it's questionable whether that's a good thing. Okay. So hopefully that gives you something to think about. And please read that article I wrote on, you know, how much um, admin is appropriate for a Canadian charity. How often should your legal objects be reviewed? Uh, for some groups, uh, every five, 10 years is good enough uh, in the sense that they haven't changed anything they've done in 100 years. And, uh, and that's okay. Um, but for many groups, it's reviewed, I think you mean here, to actually potentially be changed and all this. But you should be looking at your objects every month or two just to double check that what you're doing still fits within them. So you should stick it on your wall, your objects. And the main thing is make sure what you're thinking of the objects are really the objects. I've seen groups who are clearly working on certain objects, but they didn't realize, you know, they were set up in 1946, but in 19... 70 they were the objects were changed and they don't realize that so they're working on the wrong objects so make sure you're working off the right objects but there's no some groups are very dynamic changing a lot the areas they're in are changing a lot they need to look more quickly at it okay um are there pitfalls in paying a stipend or honorarium to a volunteer yeah there are lots of uh, pitfalls um first of all the the likelihood is they will not be considered a volunteer uh, so you really it's an area of provincial regulation and and things like that but you really want to be careful people use words like honorarium stipend for some people it means fifty dollars you're giving them like a gift card or something because they you know are doing a whole presentation for you but for other people it's like a five thousand dollar thing so it's a very dangerous area you could be turning someone who you call a volunteer into a person who's actually an employee but not paid uh, according to all the employment standards, acts, and codes that are there. So be very careful about how you deal with volunteers. Um, you've got independent contractors, you've got employees, and you've got volunteers. And there is sometimes confusion about where one begins and another ends, et cetera. But it can be very detrimental. Many organizations have stopped certain programs because – you know, for example, they were calling them interns, not paying them, but it wasn't appropriate. And um, they realized they could get into a lot of trouble. So you've got to make sure if it's a volunteer thing, it really is a volunteer thing. Okay. Um, where can we find information on what kind of investments charities are allowed to do? Any restrictions and regulations? There's a That's a whole topic for, uh, you know, an hour or two. But basically, uh, you know, trustee acts deal with it. Charities can't just invest like any company. There's lots of sort of rules as to how they can operate and do things. If you're in Ontario, the public guardian and trustee has a whole bit on uh, investments by charities. Um, other provincial governments may have uh, some information on that as well. Um, but it's something, I mean, most charities don't have a lot to invest. They don't have to worry about that too much. But for those, uh, you know, the 1% or the 5% who have a lot, uh, they need to make sure that they're they're doing it correctly. Otherwise, as an example, in Ontario, if the stuff goes up in value, no problem. But if it goes down in value, the directors can be personally responsible for the, how much it went down if they're not following the rules. So that's a big incentive to make sure one is following the, the rules. Um, 
business activities. What about rental property? If you own a building, rent out space to a business that has nothing to do with your mission. It could be okay. It could be not okay. It depends on the circumstance. I think we've even put up on our website a, a CRA document that we got through the Freedom of Information on this topic of rental properties by charities that you might find uh, helpful. Uh, can making investments, mission or program related investments have an impact on charity status? Oh, absolutely. Um, so if you're interested in something called PRIs, MRIs, mission related investments, program related investments, we just did a $200 million uh, situation, uh, you know, with a fund in Africa and things like that. There's a lot that can be done. But if you do it uh, in a way that isn't in accordance with the rules, you, you obviously can be revoked. So um, yeah, I would say um, it's something that can be in some cases helpful. And it's a little bit confusing because it's called program related investments, but it's not an investment in the normal sense. And if you are interested in this topic, I would say look at CRA, CED, Community Economic Development Guidance. It has some information on that. Um, very different also than in the US, a lot of confusion because of that. So, uh, but yes, look at the CED guidance from CRA and you'll find a lot of material on PRIs and MRIs, okay? Um, what is an example of a restricted gift? Does this include uh, government funding? Uh, government funding, yes, can often be a restricted gift. Doesn't have to be. It depends on how it goes. Um, but an example of a restricted gift, if um, someone gives money, let's say, to a charity uh, to respond to um, the floods that are happening in a particular city, um, you know, that could be restricted. If they just give money to the charity that happens to be working in that area, but it's not a restricted gift, they're not saying it has to be spent on that, it could be spent on anything, then it's not a restricted gift. Um, but, you know, sometimes money will be raised for like the earthquake in Haiti or a cyclone in uh, Burma, Myanmar, or whatever. And if money is being raised for something very specific, then that would be an example of a restricted gift. Or it could be a 10-page agreement where a donor says, I'm giving you money and it's for uh, a scholarship fund but you can only use the income. So it's a perpetual gift and you can only use the income and all that. And that gets into a whole bunch of uh, complexities, costs, et cetera, that are there for uh, charities that they have to watch out for. We have a course, if you're interested, uh, it's about an hour and a half, just goes into restricted gifts and some of the complexities there. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of things can be considered uh, restricted gifts. Uh, let me see. Uh, the last question I have is for automatic uh, e-receipts sent by email. May you confirm that the laws are still that charities need to void the original tax receipt and reissue it, or can charities resend the electronic receipt with the same info as the original receipt? So I, I don't know if this question is asking really about a situation where um, a person loses a receipt and they want to send the exact same receipt. Unfortunately, the CRA guidance and rules is more based on the more paper world that we used to live in 10 or 20 years ago. So I would say this is something you could go to CRA and just say and find out what they say about it. But in general, I think that, and I'm not saying this is CRA's position, but I think my own personal position is that um, if you were to just resend an email to someone who's lost their thing, you're not really reissuing a receipt. It's not a new receipt. It's the exact same receipt. I mean, the same thing if you sent them one PDF with it, they could print it off 50 times, but they're not going to file it 50 times with CRA. They could get into a lot of trouble for that. So I'm not seeing an issue there. But if it was an original receipt from a book and they've lost it and you have to redo it, then yes, you need to cancel it and you need to do all of that stuff. Okay. So those were the questions. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to Charity Village for pulling this all together. I know it's a lot of work for them. And uh, if there are other things that uh, people need help with and they want to retain our law firm, you know, you can always write to us. And if it's something we may be able to help with, we'll let you know. So thank you and hope you have a great day. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, again, I'd like to remind everyone that you will receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the webinar recording. Please feel free to share this link with your colleagues. The email will also include a survey link that you can fill out with your feedback on today's webinar. You should see a survey link pop up right here in Zoom following the session as well. On behalf of Charity Village, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you'll join us for our next free webinar, The AI, the AI Advantage, How Nonprofits Can Rise to the Top Using Artificial Intelligence. You can find more information on this and all of our upcoming webinars at charityvillage.com forward slash webinars. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.